The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. And co-hosts... Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures, all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Welcome back to the option block and i hope all of our listeners out there had a great and fun filled and exciting holiday weekend we have indeed been off for a little while but now we're back we're back in force and my name is mark longo i will be your host for this ridiculous round table through the world of options and i am joined as always by my obsequious entourage starting off with the man from the mountains himself None other than Uncle Mike Tussaw from Know Your Options, Inc. Uncle Mike, how was your holiday weekend, sir? Oh, it was exciting. You know, it's thing, You know, there's a lot of bad press about America these days, but it's just it's you go to a Fourth of July parade, you look at fireworks just for it's been the same my whole life. America's the best country in the world. Gotta love bad it. Bad press about America. What press, what press are you reading, sir? Nothing but apple pie and hot dogs and everything's right with the world over here. Well, no, oh, not through here, but just when you read, when you hear about stuff like how uh, we're gonna have, if we don't get this debt ceiling resolved, where America is gonna be go- done, and uh, with all the financial crises that go on, are we gonna be in a double dip recession? You know what? America is the best country in the world. It's gonna continue to be the best country in the world. God bless America. You heard it here first. So all you Europeans and all you South Americans and everybody else, just just tune out now. We have no need for you in our audience. Uh, America, number one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not prejudiced, though. I guess I hate everybody else with those comments. There you right? go. Yeah, you hate everybody <laughs> equally. So uh, it's 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 relatively egalitarian on your part. We are also <laughs> we are also joined by good old Darth Tim Navabi from Options Express, filling in the Options Express hot seat. Mr. Tinov, Darth Tinov, I heard you went on a extended vacation up to the UP over the holiday. How was that? Uh, it was perfect. It was really enjoyable. Um, yes, I was in uh, northern Michigan, not quite the UP, but still quite quite far up there, about five or six hours drive. And uh, I got to say, you know, I do agree with Mike um, that – you know, Fourth of July is my favorite holiday. Um, I always say that I wouldn't be such a Scrooge in the winter if uh, Christmas was in July. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, to me, that is just like a celebration of, you know, my living in the United States, and I really enjoy it. I mean, I'm very thankful for you know, everyone who's been before me, who's fought for my freedom. I mean, no, I know we're not talking about Memorial Day, Memorial Day here or Veterans Day, but um, still, I think it's just a special day. And, you know, I really enjoy my freedom in life and freedom that I have here in this country. So it's my favorite holiday, too. Well, we have quite the Star Spangled episode going today. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's your, uh, yeah, that's the name of your show there. I feel, uh, <laughs> I can feel the patriotic tide rising within me. 
or perhaps that's my lunch. Uh, you, I'm not sure. <laughs> now, do you go downtown for the fireworks, Mark? Or do you of course, do yes, we the did. Weekend? The little man took the little man out. He's discovered fireworks, and he finds them to be quite fantastic. So we had to go see the fireworks, and he could narrate to me every single one that he saw and what he thought he looked like. So he kept seeing a lot of Mickey Mouses and uh, He-Man and other things in the fireworks, which makes it pretty fun to to watch fireworks like for the first time through a two year old's eyes is always pretty fun. And so yeah, we I, had fun. And of course Taste of Chicago was in town. For those of you not in the Chicago area, it is our big summertime eating extravaganza and we did our fair share of that as well. So it was a fun time all around. And we will be joined in progress by the old sea bass. I believe he is closing out a gig right now with the mini medals as we speak. But as soon as they pack up their gear, he will join us. So with that, we will roll right into the trading block. The trading block. Welcome to the Trading Block. This is, of course, the part of the show we talk about what has been trading, what's moving the markets today. And it was yet another day when the bulls were out in force today. S&P closed up 14 handles even to 13.53. The Dow closed up 93 to 12.719. Then the good old NASDAQ rallying hard after a long period of getting crushed and underperforming all the other indices. Closed up 38 handles, nearly 39 to 28.72. And the good old VIX cash continuing to put money in good old Seabass's pocket. Closed down today, 0.38 to 15.96. Uh, Did you close out your VXX trade or are you still short volume? Uh, Almost almost all of it. I unwound... uh... I, I held some of my longer term. I'm, I'm holding all my long term stuff. I got out of the July. So. Ah, long term vol beer. Here we go. Well, that, well, that's more of a strict product of the VXX itself than my, my opinion on long term volatility. And I know, Uncle Mike, you've been uh, taking this rally as an opportunity to, to take some risk, take some positions off the table over there at Know Your Options, correct? Yeah, today was. Uh... Uh, the, the the BBI was uh, quite was definitely lower today for uh, sure. A lot of put rolling, a lot of collar in today, huh? Yeah, like for just for just I'm just going down my list here with Apple. We originally just a few weeks back, uh, as in I think two weeks back even, we had the put level at 300, and today just towards the end of the day, I mean I don't know for sure if the employment report's going to make the market go down, but if there is anything that can make it go down, it's that. So I'm being cautious right now. So like with Apple, we had already bought our way out of our covered call in the original collar. So I basically recollared it today. So just for the next week, we have the 350, 370 collar on for Apple. Paid a little bit of a debit for it, but you know what? If we go down that's a great hedge, but if we go up, I will gladly admit to being wrong and take the the collar off once Apple touches the 370 level you know, in the next week. You know, speaking of Apple, right the run today was um, I bought some puts in AVSPY. Remember, we had uh, a while back we had Paul Gigante on from uh, Nasdaq OMX, and he was talking about this AV, the these alpha, indices, uh, alpha yeah. products. Remember that these alpha indexes, and you know, I just noticed Al- Apple has been massively outperforming SPY. And, uh, you know, I think into earnings, that's got to slow down. So rather than short Apple, because Apple could still catch a rally at the market, or do some sort of long SPY play, I just bought a couple puts in this AVSPY. Um, You know, really short term, I bought some July 134s for like 70 cents. And all we need is a couple of days of the mar- either the market not rallying and Apple selling off back down to 345 or the market rallying and Apple sitting still. You know, one of the interesting things about Apple is that they're kind of like the second banana. You know, Google is actually the top banana in the, the phone business. That always told me don't buy the second. But for right now, there's a lot of people this um, I don't think it's a three hundred six dollars, but um, while I'm not willing to bet on and it going down or up, I am willing to bet that it's not going to continue to outperform uh, the S and P five hundred at this point. I think I think this rally in it, which has been what almost twenty percent from the bottom, is uh, is got a pull. 
So yeah, this thing was trading yeah. three ten just uh, a little over two weeks ago. I mean, it was trading the yeah. three ten handle, which is insane. It's almost a fifty point rally at this point. Yeah, it's about like a, it's like a, it's like a it's what sixteen seventeen percent rally. Yeah, about seventeen percent. If you were trading AVSPY today, you were trading one of the twelve contracts that went up today. I'm looking at it right now. We've got uh, a ten lot of the July thirty fours went up. And then a one lot of the 132s and a one lot of the 134 puts. That is it today. So, Sebastian, if that was you, you did one twelfth of all volume for today. <laughs> well, at least you know he's telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. Someone was trading the 134s out there. Yeah. But, yeah, they are a little, uh, a wee bit wide. Nothing terrible considering the, how illiquid they are, but a wee bit wide. Mr. Navabi, I imagine you guys have been seeing Apple lighten up the tape over at OX lately? Definitely. Um, you know, we're still seeing people put on Apple trades. Um, I talked to somebody today. He's a, uh, a spread buyer um, on Apple and Google. Um, and today he basically took a lot of his positions off. Um, but he had been adding them on, uh, I would say, probably over the last three weeks. And, yeah, I mean, you know, we were – Definitely not in this bull mode. I mean, you know, the, us amongst the show here, you know, n not that long ago. Um, and all of a sudden this rally just comes along and changes, uh, you know, changes everyone's sort of thought uh, right, right around. Not that we're getting, you know, extremely bullish right here, but I'm just saying it just, you know, really, really comes out. Comes out of nowhere and really just takes people by surprise. Yeah, Uncle Mike, it's hard to believe just, I believe it was last show, we were debating which half of the 12 half 1300 strangle would, would be hit first. And now we've blown through that. Now we have to talk you know, 1325, 1375, it seems like, on that S&P strangle. It's amazing. Yeah, this is something. I think we're at, we're at, at over, I think it's 10 days we've gone almost 100 points. So at this rate, by fall, the market will double then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no foreseeable way that that could ever possibly curtail or in right. any way. In any way yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, the futures, until the Fed stops letting these guys park futures as collateral, um, there's no stopping the market. That that is That is the driver behind this rally. It's all futures parking, eh? Well, no, I mean, it, the Fed, it basically, my understanding, and I heard this from a very inside source, is that the Fed is letting people buy futures on the open market, park it, all right, collect, collect the interest, and then they sell them when it, uh, it rallies enough. And then when the market drops enough, these guys buy a bunch of futures, Park the assets with the with the Fed as collateral. So imagine this: you park futures, you use collateral, use that collateral to buy stocks, and then everything runs up. You sell the stocks, you you dump the futures, you dump the stock. That is the game going on right now. It is insane. Mr. T. Nov, you're uh, you're more of a futures margin man than I. Is that uh, does that ring any bells to you? Um, it's it's something that I could probably picture happening. Um, something that I have no experience or familiarity with, uh, in that, you know, I mean, they are really doing this on a, you know, large scale institution, um, yeah, this is style huge level. Huge I mean, this is, you know, this isn't, uh, well, they're not, you know, they're not calling you up Charles for a 10 Schwab lot, Tim. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to be as big as Charles Schwab, which OX is always. So, this is even too small. This is <laughs> too yeah, big for I mean, it's... No, <laughs> no, I think this is like a Bank of America, Goldman, Citigroup. That's probably it. Maybe, maybe some of the huge, 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 huge money management funds. But uh, yeah, this is like clearing firm size type of, of trades. Well, and that just speaks to the general tone that money is still essentially free right now, and people need to put that those assets to work somewhere. So until 
you know, until the Fed tightens that up a bit, I think we're going to see continued upside. We've just been looking at refinancing our house. It's amazing. We just bought it a few years ago. It's amazing. A, the rates you can get. B, the products that are being constructed now. I mean, you're talking an arm that doesn't adjust for seven years. So it's a fixed three and a half percent for seven years. And then it adjusts at the eighth year and it's capped. And, and, you know, money is essentially free at this point. It's ridiculous. Not that I'm complaining, but it's, it is it is ridiculous. <laughs> And with that, we're going to roll right into the odd block. The odd odd block. block. All right, and welcome to the odd block. This is the portion of the show where we discuss the interesting and or the unusual options activity that is lighting up the tape today. And we are going to start with good old... Uncle Mike's favorite, Amcor Technology, Inc., ticker symbol AMKR. They closed today at $6.53, up $0.62, cents, or about 10.5%. And this is the name that does a whopping 300 contracts a day. They did 43000 today. So it's one of these... Uh, Love it with these six dollar stocks. Yeah, that do no volume, do fifty thousand contracts. They are pretty fun. It was like, tickles we like, my soul. <laughs> it tickles um, your soul. <laughs> well, now that we've tickled your soul, sir, as you're staring up at the naked painting of series, this is a semiconductor testing and assembly company, and they're seeing mm-hmm. a lot of bullish activity today in this name. As you might imagine, the bulk of them are on one strike. They're on the calls, and it's in the August Aug sixes, which went up today. A total of nearly nearly 30,000 contracts on the AUG 6s alone, 28,500, on a previous open interest of 114 contracts. <laughs> That's crazy. I love it. I love the whole thing. The bulk. Uh, you know, is, that, is that iPhone related, or is that is that a? Because there were a lot of semiconductors that were up pretty big today, um, and they were mostly iPhone related. Uh, Triquent, which makes a chip for the iPhone was up big. There were a few other of those. Um, so I'd be interested in, I don't know anything about this company. Yeah, one of the other, uh, one of the other but, ones we have, have in the block is another semi name. They were up as well. They were up because of an upgrade. I don't know of any particular upgrade that hit, or any particular news at all for Amcor, but they uh, maybe they're just feeling the love from the upgrades across the sector. And I'd imagine a lot of these upgrades mm-hmm. are coming, you're right, from the increased demand for a lot of these mobile devices that are coming yep. out down the road. Yeah, we saw the bulk of these yep. calls were lifting offers, over 80% lifting offers on these AUG 6s, trading in the 80 to 90 cent range for the bulk of them. This is a, <laughs> this is a serious, serious bullish activity. Why would, you pay, why would you pay 90 cents for the calls when you just buy the stock? For, for six bucks and change. Yeah, you know, or, I mean, I mean, you figure you can margin the stock for you know around three and then work the rest. I mean, yeah. Where's the, where's the seven? Where were the seven calls trading? The sevens are trading. Went out thirty cents at forty. About forty five hundred went up. That is those as well. You know, very rarely do I like the amazing upside call. But if you think this thing is going to rally like that, the probably the AUG seven makes a lot more sense than the AUG six. Um, just because why would you want the in the money stuff? You know. So, well, a lot of these weren't in the money until today's trading activity, too. So that's probably that drove right. a lot of these up. These were trading, you know, uh, half that earlier or yesterday. This was, stock was trading 590 yesterday. So all this. Well, those those 113 people that already had those calls are pretty happy yeah. people. <laughs> They're happy fellows, indeed. All, <laughs> all 114 of you. <laughs> I love these names. These are these are some of my favorite ones to bring up because it's it's just so absurd. Okay, next we'll roll into good old AEO American Eagle Outfitters. They closed today at nearly fourteen bucks, thirteen dollars and ninety five cents, and they closed up eighty two cents on the day, or about six and a half percent. This is the name that does about forty eight hundred contracts a day. That did nearly a hundred thousand today. <laughs> this is uh, another. Jesus, this is another yeah. good one. There's some guy, you know, um, it was up big on, on the retail news this morning. Some guy just unloaded the uh, Fed uh, 15 calls at 120, 115, and 110. Um, my thoughts is this guy, this is laid into a buy right. Um, but what he ended up doing was completely overselling those calls. Um, on his, you know, so the guy's probably bullish that was selling these calls. I mean, can you think of another reason why somebody sells 65,000 
of the uh, A of, of the, the Feb Fifteen. <laughs> yeah, no, this has covered or by right written all over it here. Right. Well, the neat thing was is then I took that guy. I said, okay, well, I'll buy your calls for one ten that you're selling, and then I'll sell the seventeen call, and then I'll sell the uh, the sixteen calls at. Uh, so I'll buy your sixteen calls for a buck ten, then I'll sell your seventeen calls at eighty cents twice. And then I'll buy your 18 calls for 50 cents, and I'll end up owning your. Uh, I'll end up owning a completely bullish spread for free, and uh, that is all because you decided to oversell one strike. Thank you very much. Yeah, he crushed it. Look at this ball on the strike. These went out a dollar at a dollar ten with the stock at nearly 14 dollars, and these are the Feb 15 calls we're talking about. In AEO, they went up 66,400 times. So yeah, this is another case, I believe, of where we see people with a little more money than cents in the options markets. Uh, completely, yeah. like you said, completely crushing. I love that. I mean, there are so many better options than the... My, my guess is the is the only person that this guy is dumber than is the guy that executed the order. Of course, you know, if you got your client breathing on your neck, when am I done? When am I done? Maybe he just he wants to get the guy done, you know? Yeah, well, it was great. The guy, the guy got done with 4000 at 120 4000 at 115 and 55000 at 110 Great, great execution, oh. guys. Oh, my God. They faded him the whole way down. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. That's, was that's painful. <laughs> That, yeah, that's pretty bad. But, of course, if you're a broker, nothing better than a rich, dumb client. I bet you this guy's, this guy's saying thank you for getting me filled. What do you, what do you think of that execution that was, there, Mr. Tina? That was Tim Navabi on execution services there. <laughs> Get him done, you know. I mean, uh, if that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do. So, no, my, guess, I mean, my guess is uh, the, broker, the broker had took the other side of a large portion of the one. So. <laughs> if they're smart, if this was the old Schwab desk days, they would have taken down the other side a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Back when uh, Tony Saliba was running all that stuff over there. Yep. All right, then. And then good old AEO. I think we'll, we have another semiconductor, but we've already hit the semiconductor, so we can hit that one really quick. KLA 10 core, ticker symbol KLAC. They uh, they were upgraded yeah. today to buy from UBS, and that drove a lot of the activity. July 42 is getting picked up, about five to 6,000 of these for $0.60. Cents. So a lot of bullish activity across the board in the semis. Mark, was there any novellus uh, flow against the KLA Tentacore? Because there's a, a, a well-known pairs trade between those two. So I'd be interested to see if uh, everything was bullish or if it was, uh, you know, there was some clacker and then maybe a little bearish play on the on novellus. Well, Novellus didn't follow suit with the others. It only did about 6,000 contracts today where the rest were pushing up size. I'm looking here. Yeah, Novellus closed at 3681. It looks like the bulk of the activity today, about 2,000 of the July 34 puts went up for about between 20 and 30 cents. So a little bit. I don't, I don't know. I don't have to pull up time and sales on these, but um, I'd be interested to see if that was, there was some pairs trading going on there. But it's still, it's it's pretty small. It's uh, you know, seventeen hundred yeah. contracts versus sixty. But these are all buys. They bought. Oh, actually, no. Some guy dumped them, eleven hundred of them for twenty cents. <laughs> Nice. So, right. yeah, this guy was... Uh, That's always a great sale. I'm going to sell something <laughs> for 20 cents. So the answer to your question is then is uh, doesn't look like it. Not in Novellus anymore. No. Uh, no, not today. But, um, yeah, Thor Attack will finish it up really quick. Ticker symbol Thor. That's a good one. I know Uncle Mike likes that. Uh, ticker symbol being of the Viking persuasion himself. And uh, we saw, talking about people Viking just persuasion. people just coming out and hitting uh, all sorts of ridiculous bids. This guy came out in this name that closed today at $35.44, up $0.86. Cents. They do about 700 contracts a day, this one. They did 36000 today, and a good chunk of them, about 24000 were in the July 35 puts, where one guy just came out and just kept crushing these things, sold a, the bulk of them, about 22000 at prices ranging from 20 to $0.30. Cents. Uh, the total open interest on all options for Thor before today was 24,000 contracts. So you got more than that going up just on this one strike here. And it uh, looks like the rest of the activity was just uh, scattered, some downside. Looks like some people legged into the spread buying the uh, July 34 puts 9,000 times today. So they sold that spread for anywhere from, looks like about 15 to 20 cents. Size put seller in Thor, I don't follow this name that much, not too much news at all in what this uh, name is doing. Just an interesting, out of the blue, tons of put selling in this name. Only Speaking of Thor, um, Mark, I need to ask you, did you see the new Transformers movie over the weekend? Okay. I did. 
Uh, we went. Me and, too. We went me and saw too. it. Specific, let me just put the caveat here for anyone who's rolling their eyes that I would go see this film. But <laughs> the uh, we the caveat is they filmed the bulk of it around our place. We live here in downtown Please. Chicago, so we spent oh, right. the bulk of last year walking through Cybertron and Chicago rubble. And actually, right. I have pictures of myself and the little guy with the Optimus Prime truck and with Ironhide. It was really fun. So for that reason alone, we wanted to go see what we actually watched. Being we saw boats burning in the river. And it was oh, yeah. it was a crazy just explosions on the streets. If you were in Chicago last summer, it was insanity. So we wanted to see that, yeah. and and it pretty much delivered exactly what we expected, which was a nonsensical, almost offensively absurd plot and some explosive action scenes with uh, some robots fighting and Chicago being destroyed yet again. It wasn't enough that the Joker destroyed it in Dark Knight. Now the Decepticons have destroyed it. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to say, I, I found the movie exactly. It was enjoyable, and if I. Because I chose to dis- to suspend all of my disbelief in critical thinking while watching the movie, I did enjoy myself certainly better than than the second movie. Wouldn't you? Would you not agree? Yes. Oh, that's hard. Hard not to be worse. And we did watch them film that final scene on that bridge. I was right in front of my wife's office. So we actually watched them film that over and over again from multiple angles yeah. as Shia LaBeouf ran in and had the hard job of scooping up and kissing that Victoria's Secret model over and over again. And it was I actually know, inter- interesting to watch. They had, you know, markers laid out on the bridge. I said to my wife, I bet you that's where the, where the robots are going to be standing in the final film. And sure enough, if you watch the final shot as they're peeling back with the camera, all the optim- all the Autobots are there on the bridge. It's pretty cool to see how they made all that stuff and taking pictures with Bumblebee. The, the thing I thought what was really funny was when the uh, Sentinel Prime said, uh, the good of the many outweigh the good of the few, uh, while, when he was fighting with Optimus Prime as a throwback to uh, the end of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Die? That was Leonard Nimoy, and I was, I was thinking to myself, I was like, that, that line sounds familiar. I couldn't remember where he said that, but that, you're right, yeah, that was... was from- that was the end of Star Trek. You're right. Holy crap. He dies. Yeah. When Spock dies. That's his, yeah, he said that. So I thought that was really funny. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll end our Transformers talk. I'm sure our listeners are like, no, more of that. So in any, any event, if you're at all interested in seeing Chicago be destroyed, then by all means, see the last 45 minutes of Transformers. It's, it, it's a fun movie. It's a fun movie. It's, yeah, it's not, see, and, and in 3D, it was great. Yeah, see it on the big screen. Don't see it uh, anywhere else. No, it is not a DVD rental no, on any no, level. No, not at all. All right, and with the Transformers block complete, we will roll into the Darth Navabi block, a.k.a. the Express block. The Express block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading, from advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express allows you to trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy to use trading platforms including mobile devices. Visit optionsexpress.com/oxradio for your free account. Options Express Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Welcome to the Express Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where Darth Navabi and his respirator of destruction (laughs) takes over the show and lets our listeners know about what's lighting up the tape, what's interesting, what's caught his eye over in Options Express land. Mr. Navabi, take it away, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate that. A um, couple things I just wanted to go over. Uh, you know, I kind of wanted to give a commodity roundup, uh, see what's going on in the futures markets here. Um, I'm going to look at something here live. So, you know, as far as what was moving today, <laughs> uh, sugar. Um, sugar was a big mover today. It looks like up over 7% on that one. And then, you know, heating oil is up there, rough rice, copper, crude oil. Uh, feeder cattle. Um, so it looks like, you know, we have a couple big commodity movers there uh, on the upside. And as far as on the downside, not much except natural gas. And, you know, every, the, the one thing that everyone is just waiting for a rally on, it isn't occurring. Uh, yet everyone's for the, waiting for a break on the equities, and that's not occurring either. Funny how that works all the time. Um, some of the other things that are really moving here. Um, at Options Express. Uh, let me first give a quick rundown as far as what were some of the uh, most actives here. Um, SPY number one. Uh, number two, it was the RUT. Uh, 
three was the SPX, and then we have our favorites. We have Net, uh, sorry, Apple, then Netflix, SLV, Google, Triple Qs, VIX, and then Baidu. So uh, those were some of the big movers here. Um, most active, most actives, I should say. Um, and then you know some of the um, some of the other movers that we had. You know, Microsoft um, saw a number of those trades today. Exxon Mobil, a number of those trades. Um, uh, GE, you know, a number of those trades going on. Uh, and JP Morgan. So uh, those are just a couple of other names um, that were pretty active here at Options Express. And then um, I wanted to go over the trade uh, trade idea from Rob. Uh, from Rob Cape, uh, he put that out on the Espresso blog, and essentially, um, what he's looking to do here is to sell a strangle in crude oil. Um, his strikes were sell the 94 put for August and sell the 104 call. Uh, at the time of the writing, he had put this on. Uh, or he didn't put it on, but uh, he was looking for a credit of about 75 cents. Um, you know, selling that 104 call naked, um, you know, is uh, very risky. So, you know, he did have a couple other ideas um, to limit the risk. So he thought, you know, what you can do is actually buy double – double the number of contracts of the 109 call uh, and double the number of contracts on the 89 puts. Um, if you did kind of want to uh, let it ride and, and see where it goes, um, what you could have done uh, or, you know, what you could do is just essentially, <laughs> you know, wait for that underline to cross 90 or cross 104 uh, and then get out because uh, something's going to move there. So, um, you know, kind of what he sees here is pretty much a low off of uh, a move off the lows from the 90 area. Um, yet, you know, the Chinese, you know, are raising interest rates uh, and trying to cool off their economy, and that just hasn't seemed to work. So, you know, it seems like, you know, he's trying to play some of this effort of, uh, you know, trying to cool things off, and, and maybe that will have, have an effect on the crude oil market. Uh, we should just kind of stop it right here. Um, <laughs> it's and, and he pretty was saying, risky trade. He was saying Go he was saying front month. I forget which month was he talking. He was about? Uh, choosing the August. August, okay, a little bit longer term, but still, yeah, that's a courageous trade. I like it to think that oil's going nowhere anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely. Uh, I don't. I don't know. You know, or, I mean, it's definitely moving. Um, you know, but I think. You know, over the longer term, you know, I mean, it, it, it could be right back where we are, you know, um, but definitely oil does not stay still. I mean, it's really, really been a mover these days. So, um, that seems you know, a, that's, so almost that's my, a out of character, the really risky trade for Rob K. A for, lot of our listeners know him as being a sedate, more relaxed fellow. It doesn't seem the kind of guy who's going to uh, let the dice fly high on a strangle sale like that. Yeah, you know, but um, it's pretty good because, you know, I've, I've worked with Rob for a long time. Um, I've uh, read him for a long time. And, um, you know, sometimes you need that. You know, you don't need that, uh, you know, screamer person yelling with the red face, uh, you know, getting all emotional over their trades. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely calm, cool, and collected. And, um you know, so this was uh, this was his idea here. So I, I thought it was a pretty good trade there. Yeah, Uncle Mike, you watch a lot of the uh, the commodities. What do you think of this strangle sale in in oil? Well, I don't know if um, I think I'd be more inclined to do something along the lines of maybe a condor or something like that in oil. Um, I do watch oil pretty regularly. I don't have any positions on it right now, but. Um, Typically not a fan. If if you have very deep pockets, I like the trade. But if not, you got to be careful with that one. Because if you're doing a naked short strangle on the big crude contract, I know it's it's highly unlikely that oil will go to zero. But if it goes from ninety to zero, you're out ninety grand per contract. And if you're if if you're saying, oh, he's just trying to scare me, well, the answer is yes, I am. So. <laughs> 
if you are going to do something like that, make sure you have some type of a contingency in place or make sure you have an ultra tight risk management plan going. Because if you wait until those options get to the, the 90 or 91 level to get out of it or the 103, 104 level, wh whatever the case may be, uh, you're going to lose a lot more than 75 cents, most likely, depending on when the time comes. So uh, I would just be re I would do the trade, but I would keep your eyes glued to the computer with your finger ready to click the mouse to get out. Uh, it's something to where I, I don't have a problem with it, but just have a real tight risk management plan. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. And uh, I'm glad Mike brought that up because, yeah, I mean, this is not a cheap contract. Um, and, you know, when it starts to move, it moves. And, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you, you could really um, take on too much risk by, by not, you know, measuring it correctly. And, of course, it is worth reiterating that he is not selling this strangle on USO. He's doing it in the big futures and the options on the big futures. So it is an inherently right. pricey and risky, risky trade to put on just by the nature of the contract itself, as Uncle Mike alluded to. What else is going on over there in OX land these days, Mr. Navabi? Uh, over here in OX land, not too much. Um, you know, it was uh, it was good to get busy again um, after the holiday. We were uh, we were quite quite slow there for a while, um, leading up to the holiday, as always in every brokerage house I've always been to. But um, yeah, just you know, getting busy. Um, you know, looking forward to some of the changes and learning about what these changes are going to be with regards to uh, our merger with Schwab, and um, not too much else really. Are you getting more information about what's going to happen? Uh, anything you want to illuminate our listeners on? N no, uh, nothing that I can really share, and nothing that uh, I've really been informed um, uh, informed of specifically. Um, but uh, I definitely you know, can can start to feel some excitement and uh, a little bit more activity, um, you know, with regards to that. All right, Mr. T-Nob, that is going to do it for the Express Block. And now we'll roll right into the Strategy Block. Hmm, the Strategy Block. And welcome to the strategy block. This is the part of the show where Uncle Mike comes down from the mountains and puts down the fishing pole and starts to discuss and dive into the world of options and risk management and trading strategies. And I have a hankering that after that discussion of shorting strangles in the big oil contracts that your strategy block is going to be about risk management today. Am I right, Uncle Mike? You are correct, sir. And uh, just to, to give you an idea of it, I, I, with Rob's trade, uh, I've known Rob for uh, years now. I used to, we, we worked at, when I worked at OX, he was at OX. And so I have a ton of respect for Rob and uh, everything that he does over at Options Express. And I like this trade, but here's what you need to be careful of when doing a naked option trade. Gamma. Right now, if you look at a specific, if you go far out of the money on naked option sales, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't have the chain up in front of me as to what the, the deltas are on this trade, but if you go pretty far out and you're, you're trading low delta options, odds are you're going to be right. Uh, the probability of this trade and both of these options expiring worthless, uh, in my opinion, the, the probability is pretty high. But oftentimes when people do high probability option trades, the punishment for a low probability event occurring oftentimes outweighs the high probability that you have of getting into the trade. So I want to tell you just a little bit about how we like to look at naked options over at Know Your Options. Uh, first off, we don't usually do a lot of naked options, but when we do, whether it's a naked option or a credit spread, uh, let's say that we just took out a seven delta option. Let's just say I'm randomly selling a seven delta option. I'm um, short a put, it's way out of the money, and the delta is uh, seven. So what I'm going to look at, I usually have a delta point as to when we want to get out of the trade. If the stock goes higher or the commodity goes higher, or if it stays the same, great. We do nothing, the put expires worthless, and we all look like geniuses. 
Unfortunately, that's not reality every time. So you need to have a plan of when to get out should it go against you. What I like to tell people is usually when the Delta gets to around, if you're, if you're doing like a two-sided Condor, then usually if a Delta of one of the short options goes from 7 to 25, that's our point to where we'll either make an adjustment by either perhaps buying another put to hedge some risk or maybe rolling the spread out or just getting out of the trade for that matter. So if you're doing a Condor, our general rule is if one of the short options goes from 7 to 25. Now, if you're doing a naked option, you may want to tighten that up a little bit just because of the fact that you don't have the other side helping you. So if you're just naked one side of it, then maybe start looking in the high teens to either get out of it, make an adjustment, or do something with it. Uh, my point is this. The pain that you feel from 7 delta to a 20 delta, it's going to hurt. Don't get me wrong. That's going to hurt. But... The pain you feel from the delta going from 25 to 50, it's going to be excruciating. If To give you an idea of it, I want you to do this. The pain that you feel from 7 to 25, it's going to hurt. Uh, maybe if you, if you have a four-year-old or get one of our kids, we'll, we'll send our kids over to come kick you in the shins a few times. That's the pain that you're going to feel. If you want to take it further, if you want to feel what the pain's going to be like from 25 to 50... I will let you borrow my 12 gauge and you can shoot yourself in the foot. That is the level of pain difference that it's going to be. So with that being said, if you are going to try to endure the pain all the way to being close to the short strike price, folks do it with a smaller amount of money. And that is today's strategy block. Between you and Sebastian, we have a lot of interesting indicators on the show. He has his, what is it, angry rapist jumping out of the closet with a knife. And you have the four-year-old versus kicking the shins versus shotgun in the shins indicators. We have a lot of colorful metaphors on this show. If that doesn't drive oh. the point home, I'm not sure what will, sir. I hope it does. All right. And that's going to do it for the strategy block. And now we're going to roll right into Around the Block. Around the Block. All right, and welcome to Around the Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we peer into our crystal balls and talk about what we're seeing on the horizon for the upcoming sessions. And we'll kick it off with Mr. Seabass. What are you seeing in your crystal ball for the coming sessions? Obviously, we have non-farms coming up. That's probably putting a lot of your uh, activity on hold for the time being. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on um, VIX futures as they're starting to really get kind of out of whack again. And I'm paying attention to term structure. Um, coming out of, you know, I'm, that August-September term structure has been really interesting to watch, and there's been some great trading opportunities. So uh, I've, I find it kind of really interesting um, – you know, if they sell off August anymore, I'm going to start wanting to get long August and sell uh, September against it and uh, just get long in the summer. So that's kind of kind of what I've been watching. And then um, just, you know, starting to get into earnings season. We got a lot of earnings coming out, uh, not next week. We got a COA coming out next week. Uh, and then we've got kind of a bunch of other things coming up the following week. So I, I think this should be an interesting couple of uh, – couple of days. It seems like we just wrapped up earnings season and we're diving right into it again. But c'est la vie. It really does. It's always fun for us to watch. And Al Alcoa like always kicks it off with a bang. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you for that, Mark Seabass, Mini Metals, Greasy Meatball, Sebastian. And now, Uncle Mike Tusa, what are you seeing in your crystal ball, sir, coming up for the next few sessions? Obviously, non-farms. You've talked in the trading block about how you were tightening up the risk and taking some risk off the table and tightening up those collars and rolling the puts. So I'd imagine you're pretty much just playing the wait-and-see game tomorrow. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's one where... W when you, when you have a market that's been this hot, I mean, this has been a ridiculously hot market. I said a couple of weeks ago when we were down at the 1250 level that I was starting to maybe kind of become bullish. Um, with that, I had no intention of it going up this fast. So um, 
I don't think that it's going to, you know, like I said earlier today, at this rate, the market's going to double by the fall. Uh, I don't see this continuing for too much longer, but you never know. You have to respect the market. The old, as the old saying goes, the market can remain irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So with that in mind, I think that you need to maintain a level of sanity, though, and the reason that I was tightening up a lot of things today is that if there is something that can reverse the market in a hurry, it is the the announcements that are coming out tomorrow. So uh, I'm being a little bit more cautious right now. And, you know, I'm still bullish over the long term, as I have always been for my entire career. Uh, but I, there's times that you may want to tighten up a little bit. And now's one of those times, in my opinion. Well, you were talking up on last show the potential for a bullish move in the market, so maybe listeners should pay attention now that you're turning to the dark side and starting to defend some of those gains. Maybe they should take a look at their portfolios. Of course, if they haven't done it already, it might be a wee bit too late. Buy some futures options, 24-hour trading. There you, there you go. go. There you go. Call up Tim Navabi over on the trading desk. <laughs> Get that 24-hour. As, al as always with this market forecast I just gave out, this comes along with my 50% guarantee. Always willing to go out on a limb, sir. Yes. <laughs> Your courage astounds me in, to no end. <laughs> All right. And speaking of executions over on the futures desk, Mr. Navabi, what are you watching around the block? Obviously, non-farms big for you guys as well. Do you guys come in early on big number days like that or anything different? Good question. Uh, we come in early for the uh, quadruple or triple witching. Um. That's when we come early. Non-farm, no. So you and you and Grigus load up on the coffee early on the quadruple witching days. Qu quadruple witching, yeah. That's that's pretty much the early day. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, is it just me or does non-farm really doesn't seem like it used to be? I mean, you know, we used to call it unenjoyment because it was just you know a wreck all day. Um, but now it just kind of seems like you know it's going to move the market sort of one way or another early and it's not nothing the, really. It's not know. the beast that it once was. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. have shifted their focus. I believe we spoke about it on this show numerous times too. Have shifted their focus to the housing numbers now and find them to be far more prescient in terms of leading mm -hmm. indicators for the economy. So I think non-farms to that degree has been somewhat usurped by the housing numbers and people really putting a lot of focus on them. Definitely doesn't have the full impact that it might have, say, a, a few years ago. Would you agree, Uncle Mike? Yeah, it's one where it's. I think it still has potential, but um, yeah, it's not quite like it once was. I never heard that before. Unenjoyment. That's that's good. Not like the good old days when non-farms could make a grown man tremble and weep like a little girl. <laughs> I miss those good old days. <laughs> I remember them well. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, it's going to be an interesting day. I mean, what happens? Okay, so let's say we have a great employment number. So now that sort of changes, you know, the outlook or somewhat of the near horizon to the Fed. And, you know, what's that going to do to the market compared to just another horrible, uh, you know, not another, but, you know, just a very bad employment number, you know, um, so yeah, I mean it's really yeah. Quite I mean, if, if we miss, days, if I it mean. misses hard to the upside, let's say we blow through the number by orders of magnitude, is that really? Does anyone really think that's going to have the Fed Fed take the brakes off, and all of a sudden they're going to start raising rates to to stifle this exploding economy? Of, of course not. Yet, uh, so right. it, it is kind of a mitigated indicator in that sense. Yeah, no, I, I mean I agree with you, but it's still you know it, it it's still going to make people wonder. Okay, you know. Now where are we going? <laughs> you know, uh, or, or now what the what, now what is the Fed going to do and look at it? And and you know what do you do with a, a great number? Um, buy equities. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it's just very interesting. Um, you know, it's a very interesting time period. Right as with now, all these indicators, so. you view them through your own rose-colored glasses or your beer, <laughs> your beer-colored glasses, as the case may be. And you know, if you're a beer and it comes out and you miss harshly to the downside, it's just going to reinforce your beer sentiments. The bulls have shrugged off negative non-farms for years now without really right. causing much in the way of slowing their momentum. So it will be interesting to see, you know, if this number does miss strongly to the downside, if this can derail whatever this is we're currently under undergoing, if you want to call it a rally, a uh, upside correction, a Greek party, whatever you want to call this that's going on in the market right now, if the non-farms have the muscle to uh, to cut the legs out from under. I don't know. I've seen
seen the Bulls laugh off bad non-farms too many times now to really think that one number is really going to undo it. But if anything could, maybe for the next coming sessions, it would be non-farms, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick here, you know, Citigroup has earnings on uh, July 15th, uh, JP Morgan uh, a week from today on July 14th. Um, Apple, you know, has earnings on the 19th. Microsoft has earnings on the 18th. Um, ExxonMobil on the 20th. I know that, you know, we're probably going to talk between now and then, but these are just a couple of things that um, we're sort of, uh, you know, getting ready for uh, Coca-Cola on the 19th. So, yeah, you know, I, I gave Sebastian a hard time that, you know, oh, it seems like we just got out of earnings season, but it, it will be nice to have some earnings, some proper earnings to discuss again. The old around the block has been a little bit dry for the past few months as we kind of tapered off towards the end of earnings season. There wasn't too much in the way of really, you know, interesting numbers to debate or interesting earnings mm-hmm. to debate. But earnings are always fun. They drive a lot of activity, it gives us something here to talk about and to trade right. around. So we always welcome the approach of a new earnings season. Thank you, sirs. That is going to do sure. it for this Around the Block segment. It's also going to do it for this episode of the Option Block. I want to thank all of my obsequious entourage for joining me on the show today, starting off with you, Mr. Navabi. What is coming up over at OX you want to make our listeners aware of, sir? Uh, over at Options Express, um, we are going to have a couple of events here. Um, and, you know, some of the webinars that will be uh, coming uh, in the future here, um, IRA Strategies Part 1, Covered Calls, that's on the 12th of July, 9 o'clock Eastern. Um, on the 17th, it's all Greek to me, uh, 9.30 Eastern on the 17th of July as well. Um, and as far as live events, what we've got going on here, we do have our special uh, special options insider event, uh, and uh, nothing in particular with regards to you know OX kind of traveling uh, traveling traveling around doing any any of those live events. What is so. this insider event you speak of, sir? You have piqued my curiosity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Allow me to fill in the details for you. Then. <laughs> of course, he is. Refer- <laughs> he knows. He knows it's somewhere in Chicago. We, he is, of course, referring to the Options Insider live event, the Option Block live recording session, if you will, on July 21st. That is a Thursday here in downtown Chicago at Elephant and Castle Pub. At 111 West Adams from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m., or perhaps if it goes longer from whenever we feel like finishing, however long people want to come in and enjoy the show and have some beverages. And we will be giving out all sorts of fun prizes, and we'll have live listener questions. We'll have some special guests. It will be a fun, fun, fun time for anyone who's listened to the show. Or even if you haven't, you want to bring some friends along who haven't heard it, by all means, swing on by. We have some RSVPs set up right now on the Options Insider Facebook page. We'll also be sending out some emails and putting ways on the optionsinsider.com for you to RSVP. Of course, you don't have to RSVP. By all means, you can just swing by anytime you like in that time frame. It just helps if we have some idea of how many people are going to show up. So, But if you don't RSVP, don't feel that you can't come, by all means. Everyone is welcome to come in and join in the fun on July 21st there in Chicago at Elephant and Castle, 111 West Adams, 3.30 to 6.30 be there or be Sebastian, as I like to say. And, of course, speaking of Sebastian, Mr. Seabass, what is going on over in the land of OptionPit.com? All right. I have three webinars next week, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. The, the 12th is being sponsored by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Volatility Exchange. Of uh, I'm sure you've promoted that enough to revolve you. Um, it is going to be at, uh, one, I believe, uh, noon Central Time, 1 o'clock Eastern, and uh, I'm going to be discussing the Volux Future. On Wednesday night, which is the 14th, I am, or the 13th, excuse me, I'm going to be back trading uh, a bunch of uh, butterfly trades. And then on, uh, on the 14th, I'm doing a 
uh, webinar with the Price Futures Group on charting of futures contracts. And thank you for that, sir. And last but certainly not least, we have the man from the mountains, good old Uncle Mike Tussaw. What is coming up in KYO land, sir? Well, we're getting geared up for the live show. We're excited about that. And uh, just we have some webinars on the fo- on the Sunday nights for the remainder of the month of July. Uh, we have It's All Greek to Me on the 17th. We have Strike Price Selection on the 24th. And then August 1st, we have Plan the Trade, Trade the Plan. So for more info on that, please visit our site. And allow me to throw in an additional plug for you, Uncle Mike. Good old your partner in crime, Mike Cavanaugh, will be appearing on our Volatility Views program. We'll be recording it tomorrow. That will go up for our listeners on Monday. So stay tuned for that if you want to hear what Uncle Mike's better half has to say about volatility and volatility trading. My wife's on the show. <laughs> and what's going on. Your work better half, let's put it that way. There uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> what your work better half has to say about volatility and trading and risk management in this environment that by all means tune into volatility views on the options insider radio network comes out every monday check that one out that is going to do it for the old option block i want to thank all of our listeners out there for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this show and making it such a hit and once again we definitely want to see you on july 21st at the live event so come out and see us but until then we will see you next time right here on the option block Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved. Seating program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.